Good morning. Welcome to our worship service. We're glad that you're with us today. Facebook, we want to welcome all of you there. If you want to check in with us, we'd love to love to have you check in. Let us know how you're doing. And glad all of you are here with us today for our worship service. How many of you are ready for the cold weather? Not very many. I think I might have heard one. <laughs> okay. Well, we got to get ready anyway, don't we? We're going to learn today, uh, continue learning how to work out what God has worked in us. So would you please stand and we'll begin this service with a word of prayer and then our worship team. Don't they do a great job, our worship team? Give them a round of applause. We're just, we're giving it to them beforehand because we know it's going to be great. They do a great job leading us in worship and that's what we're here for, right? It's really not about us. It's not about our experience even. It's about God's experience. We want him to be pleased with what happens today. So let's give our best for his glory today. Father, thank you for all that you've done for us in this season of Thanksgiving. May we be a thankful people. Thank you for this warm building that we have to come into to worship you and that we can do it with freedom. We don't have government authorities looking in on us or coming to shut us down, Lord. We have the freedom to worship you as we see fit. You've saved us. You've delivered us. You've healed us. You've been so good to us. We have so much to be thankful for today, and we want to give you thanks now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord our best right now. There were walls between us by the cross you broke them down, you broke them down. There were chains around us, by your grace we are no longer bound, no longer bound. You called me out of the grave, you called me into the light, you called my name and then my heart came alive. Your love is strange. Oh my 
reminded this week that remembering is a great tool, isn't it? Remember when in the 1800s when the Alamo was taken, the, the phrase went across the country, remember the Alamo. I remember the days after 9-11, we heard things like never forget, remember 9-11. This past Friday, we remembered the sacrifice of veterans for all that they've done for us. We're here because of them in so many ways today. and We'll be honoring them in a little bit, but when we take communion, that's really what it is in so many ways. Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. And we'll take bread in our hands and we'll remember that a body, a perfect, sinless human being died in our place. He shed every drop of blood for us on that cross. It, it really is a means of grace when we remember it because I can't remember it without giving thanks. I can't remember it without asking him to forgive me for where I've fallen short as he brings that to mind or to recommit to him my life or maybe to reconcile a relationship that's broken that maybe needs to be taken care of even today among us. So we're going to take communion. I'm going to ask uh, the Unruhs, I believe they're helping us. Pastor Rocky, would you come, as you usually do a lot, and Pastor Rocky will be in the middle, and the Unruhs will be on either side. And You can just come as you feel led, take your elements. We don't have any like real rules, like you have to be part of our denomination to do this. Uh, just if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. We just sung the song, I have decided to follow Jesus, right? If you've made that decision, we invite you to come to take these elements and to remember, and as you remember, express prayer back to God, and I promise you where God is present, there God acts. He will meet us here today in this communion. Let's just pray before we open the service up. The worship team will be singing. The only thing we ask is that before you take the elements, let everybody be served so that we can take it together. You might want to kneel at the altar. You might want to kneel at your seat, sit at your seat, or stand and worship, however you feel led to do that at this time. Father, as we enter into this time, 
we ask that you would send your Holy Spirit, that this would not just be an empty ritual, that this would not be something we do just because it's the second Sunday of the month, but God, that today we would give thanks, we would recommit, we would seek forgiveness, we would give forgiveness to somebody today. And God, we pray that as we do this and as we remember that you would impart new grace to us. Grace for living and loving well. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to come take the elements as our worship team leads us now in worship. that song together in worship before we take the elements. Just let's sing the next verse, please, worship team. Death could not hold you The veil torn before you You silence the blows
I think we need to keep singing, sir. Let's just sing that verse again. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ. above all names. You have no rival. You have no equal. You've defeated death and you're coming again. And it's in your name now that we take communion. And I invite you now to take and eat remembering this is the body of Jesus broken for our sins. Take and eat. we have this juice that represents blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins and remembering the name of Jesus I invite you to take and to drink Lord Jesus we give you thanks we praise your name may you be glorified in this service and in the lives of everyone here as we leave this place, may we go remembering the sacrifice made for our sins, the hope that we have because of Jesus, the joy in the midst of our uncertainties. And if there's anybody here in our midst today who they have not experienced that joy and the peace that comes from Jesus, I pray that in this service they know the grace and the peace that comes from All God's people said, amen. Go ahead and be seated at this time. We're going to take up our offering today. We have a birthday boy, Butch Shore, just turned 75 years old, and he has given his check to uh, pay for kids to go to camp in NYC. Let's give him a round of applause. I lost him. He was in here somewhere. Thank you, Butch, for your faithfulness in doing that. Ushers, you can go ahead and come on forward. I think we've already looked at the announcements. If you're a guest with us, oh, there's Butch. <laughs> uh, if you're a guest with us today, first, second, or third time, you, there's one of two things you could do right now. In your bulletin, if you're tech savvy like I'm not, but if you are, you can take a picture of that QR code and you can send a connection uh, card right to us through that. And if you not tech savvy and want to go old school, we have a connection card for you right there in your worship folder. You can fill that out and just put that in the offering plate as it comes around at this time. All we're going to do with that is keep you connected with things that are going on here at the church. You even get a little small gift with it as well when we uh, get that. So I uh, just invite you to do that if you'd like to do that at this time. Uh, just uh, one more announcement I just uh, want, need to make is most of you have heard that Charles Mayfield passed away last Tuesday morning. He'd been sick for three weeks, so we knew something was wrong, but really just passed away very suddenly. We don't we really don't even know what happened, but uh, we will be having a celebration of life for him next Sunday after the morning service. There will be a potluck, several different elements involved, so uh, if you want to be a part of that, uh, just 
definitely we ask you to be praying for the Huffman family at this time. And let's do that right now. Father, thank you for your faithfulness to us. And as we give, we give realizing, recognizing that what we're giving comes from you in the first place. You've called us to be stewards and managers of your money. And I pray that you'd help us to do that well. We pray for the Mayfield family today, that you'd minister to them, the Huffman family, that they would experience your grace and your peace at this time. And I know there's still many sick. We ask you to bring healing to their bodies and to bring them back to us soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you as you give at this time. Can you hear me? I'm here, fighting, pressing to remember what you said. That this onslaught of thoughts fills my head with dread, and I need you. Like enemies encamped, shrouded in the dark, I can feel the fascination of too many temptations reaching for my heart. So I need you to hear me. For I know your ears are attentive to the righteous, and I know that your ways are certain. Even when my worries would trample me to dust, still, I know you are good. Your hand is just. So come now, be the salvation for my sins. Help me to begin again that you would mend this trend of hopelessness. God, deliver me in my brokenness. I can feel your presence, even now in the ugly, in the mess that has been made. You surround me with your benevolence. Yes, your love is on display, and I can see it. Carving roads through the struggles and the troubles past temptations and devices that seek to choke me out. So come fear, come failure, come opposition or doubt. Jesus, you are my deliverance. Your grace is sufficient. Trusting you is my only way out. Now I turn my mind to dwell on your truth. Curate the condition of my heart to manifest joy. Be my living proof. Subdue the haters, quell the voices inside, transform me, Lord, extinguish my pride. You've won the battle, I trust in your plans. Yes, God, I surrender all my worries, my woes, and my demands into your eternally goals really can make or break us. When I uh, was in college as a freshman, I made a goal. Uh, I'll give you the background in a minute. I'll lay the goal out first. I just feel great just all over my notes, so pray for me. <laughs> give me just a second. I made a goal. Uh, kids, if you would like to join Miss Abby for Kids Church. I weren't sure if we were doing that for today, but Miss Abby's in the back. If you want to go join her, go ahead. And then we'll really start. Let's start over. Our goals really can make or break us. When I was in college, I made a decision uh, to start working out. Let me give you some background for why I started working out. I was the classic late bloomer. I don't know if any of you had that as a teenager, but when I was a junior in high school, I was five foot two and about 100 pounds. By the time I graduated, I was about 5'8", 120 pounds. Still uh, smaller than a lot of people. At, and as I went to college, definitely was smaller than a lot of them. And I had the young face. I looked like I was about 16 years old when I went to college, probably. So I made a decision to start working out. I don't really remember why I decided to do it, but I, I liked it and started kind of catching on to it and really looked forward to it every day. And somewhere along the way, early on my freshman year, my first semester, I made a goal that someday I wanted to bench press 100 pounds more than my weight. I don't know why I picked that to this day, and I had no idea how hard it was going to be. One of the problems was is that I continued to grow in college. 
it's, uh, I, I went in at 5'8", I went out at 5'10", I went in at 120 pounds, and I went out at 160 pounds because I was eating more and working out more. So one thing that got hard was I thought, well, all I'm going to have to do is bench 220 pounds, but I didn't catch up with my weight. So when I graduated college, I was 160 pounds and still hadn't hit my weight. I think I graduated with hit bench pressing about 240 pounds at that point. There's a reason I'm telling this story. We'll get to that in a minute. So most people would just say, you know what, nice try. Really, you did bench 100 pounds more than your weight because when you started, you were 120 pounds, right? But I have this thing about goals. I'm obsessed with hitting a goal and sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad just ask my fantasy football friends <laughs> and I, I just can't stand to not hit a goal that I set and like and in times it's been good and in times of my life it's been bad so I kept on working out uh, when I came to seminary in Kansas City Missouri and I think I was stuck on 250 or 255 pounds for like a year and one day I finally just had enough. I thought, you know what, I'm going for it. I put 260 pounds, actually the bar weighs 45, so you do the math, whatever needed to be put on. I put it on there. I found a really large person, and there were large people in this gym everywhere. I said, hey, could you come spot me in case this falls down on my chest and kills me, right? <laughs> and I pushed it off. I screamed real loud. I don't know why I screamed real loud, but that's what all the other large people did when they benched a lot of weight in that room. So I screamed real loud. I dropped the bar. It went off my chest a little bit, and then I pushed it up, and it, I did it. I 100 pounds over my weight, five years of work. It was almost like Rocky running up the stairs in Philadelphia. You know, <laughs> kind of felt like that, but I didn't make a big deal about it because most of the people that were in the gym, at that gym that I was working out with, they warmed up with 260 pounds. So it would have looked really kind of silly for me to be excited about doing it one time. But I thought about that story a couple weeks ago when I was working on this message, and I think I see some spiritual parallels there. You guys knew this was coming, right? I'm a pastor, so there's got to be a spiritual parallel here. And I really do think there are. One is I saw a need, I established a goal, and decided, to, and decided to work at it. So my question for you, as we begin the message, is do you have a spiritual fitness plan? Do you have a plan that's designed to help you work on some spiritual goals? Marcy, my wife and I are in a training uh, group right now, it's called Emotionally Healthy Discipleship. We just did a genogram, going back in your family and all this stuff. And we were told to write down two or three goals that we feel like the Holy Spirit's giving us to work on spiritually as a result of this class and the exercises we've done. So out of that, I have written down two or three goals, and I will be talking to somebody about that in order to know how to do that. Secondly, I set up a plan and disciplined myself to carry it through. I set up a plan and I disciplined myself to carry it through. You need a plan, and you need follow-through. I told you last week, spiritual growth does not happen automatically. It's not a guarantee. You have to work at it. It takes effort. Spiritual growth will require more effort of you than anything you've ever done. Benching 260 pounds was easy compared to some of the spiritual, emotional, mental, all these issues that we have to deal with, that I've had to deal with over the years third parallel is I got stuck along the way at times. It seemed like there would be times when I would just, every time I'd work out, I'd put on more weight, and I'd do a little bit more, a little bit more, and it just regularly. And then for, for no real reason that I could think of, all of a sudden I'd be stuck at the same weight for two or three months, and it would drive me absolutely crazy. Like, I, I went 30 pounds in a, in a month, and I've been stuck on this weight. I can't even go five pounds in the last four months. I think it was probably mental. I think something just, I got stuck. And as I look back over my spiritual life, there have been times when I'm just growing and things are moving along at a rapid pace. And then all of a sudden, I'll just get stuck and I'll stay at the same place for a while. Sometimes that's just natural. Sometimes it can be that we need to win the war in the mind that there are thought patterns and things that we've heard that are still lodged up here in our memory 
Sometimes it can be emotional, things that have been done to us in the past, and we've got to dig deep with the Holy Spirit and allow Him to clean some stuff out. Sometimes it can be spiritual. It can be a sin issue that we're struggling with, and we just can't seem to get past it. And we, we just have to keep at it until the Holy Spirit takes us past that barrier. And I promise you, if you'll keep at it, He'll get you past these barriers. And the last one is I really should have found a trainer. My mom told me at some point in the middle of this, I, I, like I said, when I, when I set a goal, I just kind of go crazy if I'm not careful. I would go, so in the summer, I would work in a warehouse all day. Every box that left that warehouse, except for maybe 20% of them, went through me, which I was glad this was part of my workout plan. And then I would go work out after doing that. Some nights I would go play softball or go play basketball after that. And it was just this constant wear on the body. And my mom told me one day, she said, Steve, you know, you're not really built like that to do this to your body. I was like, what do you mean I'm not built like that? You know, that was just like a, that was just like a challenge from my own mom, right? And now at the age of 55, I think I thought I would never really live to 55. It seemed so far away then <laughs> and so old. And I, I, I think I just, like I said, never thought I'd get here. And now as I think about back problems and shoulder problems and elbow problems and all these other stuff, I'm sure that a trainer could have probably helped me somewhere along the way. So I would ask you, do, do you have somebody who's a little bit further down the road than you in the spiritual journey? I have two men that I talk to. They're both in their mid-70s. I'm in my mid-50s. They're both former pastors, retired pastors. And I talk to them on a somewhat monthly basis and just to kind of clear things out and make sure I'm on the right track and they check in on me. I have some partners, and I would say that in this spiritual walk, we need some mentors, some trainers, and some partners that can help us get where we want. Have you gotten the impression yet that this is going to be a little bit of work? If you get it, say, got it. It doesn't happen automatically. Some people are more invested in the stats of their favorite sports personality than they are their spiritual growth program. And we wonder sometimes why we're not getting where we want to get spiritually. So I want to talk to you today about a spiritual workout. Paul said this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, Train yourself to be godly. Did you hear that? Train yourself to be godly. There's work here. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Physical training is good. I think we should take care of our physical body. Th three years ago, I told you, I was looking at my body and my health. I was like, man, if I, if I keep going the way I'm going, I'm going to have to retire for health reasons in the next five years. So, you know, we, we need to take care of that. But eventually, this body is going to turn to dust, right? This life is going to be over at some point. And this spirit that is within this body is going to live for eternity. So I need to be spending a lot of time on this spirit, the, the inside man, as Paul calls it from time to time. We need spiritual discipline to grow. You know, the root word of the word discipline, somebody want to take a guess and figure it out? Disciple, disciple discipline. Did you see that? They go, to, go together. But again, that's kind of like eating broccoli and jumping on an elliptical cycle, like I said last week, right? So I, I've given you a new phrase called means of grace. And when I think about my disciplines as a gift from God, as a means of grace to help me draw closer to God and to fulfill the spiritual potential that he has for me, it's changed my whole perspective on it. And um, for, for years it was very legalistic, but the Lord's helped me change that over the years. So I don't know, do we have that definition, Caden, on the screen, means of grace? Let's read this together. Means of grace are channels for the Lord to confer grace to the souls of people. Outward signs, words, or actions ordained of God that are designed to be ordinary channels by which he might convey to men preventing, justifying, or sanctifying grace. Now some of you weren't here last week, so let me do a little, a little quick lesson. That word for preventing, 
today we would use the word prevenient. It's the grace that goes beforehand. It's the grace of God that draws us in to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Communion is a means of grace. And communion can be a means of people coming to Jesus. It can be a means of drawing them to Jesus. Some people, while taking communion, get saved. I know theologically we say it's not supposed to happen that way in our manual, but sometimes people go ahead and break the rules and do communion, right, anyway? And you know what can happen sometimes is they can get saved right while they're taking communion. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, the blood, the body of Jesus is right there in front of them, represented by the, blood, the bread and the blood of Jesus. I have an interesting theory on that, by the way. I think Judas took communion with Jesus before he left that night. So put that in your little theological hamper and think about it. But I'm not trying to start a fight, so let's just move on. Justifying grace. Justifying grace is the grace that forgives us of our sins. God, we're in a courtroom of law, God's law. We're guilty, and God declares us not guilty by his grace. And sanctifying grace is the grace that helps us grow. Thank goodness we don't have to do this in our own strength. Paul told, uh, Paul told the Philippian church, work out what God has worked in you according to his great power that lives inside of you. God gives us power and grace. And as we do things like go to church on Sunday morning, take communion for the right reasons, uh, serve one another and witness and share the gospel. You know, nothing strengthens my faith more than sharing the gospel with somebody. Why? Because I'm sharing the gospel. It strengthens my faith just to, to speak the gospel to other people. It's a means of grace. It's not something I have to do for God to earn his approval or a pastor's approval. It's a grace, an ability, an opportunity that God gives me to grow in him. So those are some means of grace. I'm going to focus today on two personal means of grace. There are means of grace that we do together on Sunday morning, and then there are some that we do by ourselves, and there's lots of them. Solitude and silence, uh, d different things that we can do, fasting that we can do to grow spiritually by ourselves. But I'm going to talk to you today about the two time-tested means that as far as I'm concerned, if you want to be a Christian at any kind of a successful level, you've got to have down pat as soon as possible in your Christian life. And they are prayer and Bible study. Mark says this in verse, chapter 1, verse 35 of the second gospel. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, don't you just love getting up when it's still dark on a cold day like this? <laughs> Jesus got up, left the house went to a solitary place where he prayed. We'll come back to that verse in a minute, but I wanted you to see there that Jesus himself, this is the Son of God, right? 100% God, 100% man. He got up and went alone to be with God. If Jesus needs it, we need it. C.H. Spurgeon was a, one of the great preachers of the 19th century over in England, and he says the person who does not pray is the proudest person in the world because they are assuming that they can live life without God. So we need this means of grace. So I'm going to start out with prayer. and I'm just going to give you a very simple pattern that I've used for years. By the way, you've heard of it. It's called the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to walk through that a little bit. I think a better description of this, again, I may didn't pick too many fights today after the last one I did, but uh, disciples' prayer might actually be a better title for this message because this is the prayer that the Lord told his disciples to pray. It says in uh, Matthew 6, 9, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The first thing I do is I express my love for God. Now, let me say, I don't do this rigidly, um, legalistically, it's just it's just become a pattern over for me over the years. Some people have the idea that if I pray the Lord's Prayer every day of my life, I'll go to heaven just like if I eat an apple a day, I'll keep the doctor away, right? That, that's not what Jesus had in mind with this prayer. This isn't some empty religious ritual that he's given us to cross off our, our checklist and 
get us some fire insurance, hopefully, at the end of our life. Our Father, isn't it wonderful to wake up every day and know that we have a heavenly Father? Man, sometimes I just have to take time just to stop right there. I have a heavenly Father who loves me. Hallowed be your name. You could say, holified be your name. Sanctified be your name. May your name be made holy. So I spend time regularly just praising God for who he is. There's praise for God for who he is. That's praise. There's thanksgiving to God for what he's done for us. And I, you just got to, we've got to do this regularly because if we don't, we'll get negative, we'll get cynical. The news isn't good, is it? And, you know, we, we need something. So I'll, I, sometimes I'll just go through the alphabet if I'm stuck and just, if I'm having a hard time getting going, I'll just say, God, you're awesome, you're beautiful, you're compassionate, you're my defender, you're eternal, you're faithful. I'll just go right through the whole alphabet that way, just kind of get me going. And uh, Thanksgiving, God, thank you that I woke up in a house with a roof over my head and a uh, furnace. And I think about the homeless people that I see every day who don't have that. And I could so easily take that for granted. God, thank you. Uh, and I'll, I'll just take time, usually five to a few things every morning just to, to help me do that. Secondly, I commit myself to doing God's will. Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I commit myself to doing God's will. And I'll pray that. God, I pray that as I go through this day, that you will help me to establish your kingdom here on earth. I want to do your will as it's done in heaven. I want to see your kingdom come and your will be done in my life and in my marriage and in my kids' lives, in my church's life, in our nation. Sometimes I'll just pray right through that. I will often uh, think about my calendar for the day. Okay, God, I'll be got this at 9 o'clock. I've got this at 11. i got this at 1. God, help me as I'm doing these different things. Help me to prepare the way for Jesus. Help me to advance the kingdom. It's not about me. It's all about you. I'll pray for different needs. I'll pray for my five lost. I probably say five. I've got about 25 I'm praying for right now that I know through dinner church and other places that don't know Jesus. And every day I just take those names to the throne. My family gets prayed for every day. These lost people get prayed for every day. My staff members and board members get prayed for five days a week. My leaders, uh, district superintendent, gets general superintendent, they get prayed for five days a week. I just, I've got this regular pattern. I've got a pattern for the church members that I go through uh, throughout the course of the year. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it's done in heaven. Third, I request God to meet my daily needs. That's give us today our daily bread. I love this verse that Paul gave us. Do not be anxious about what? Anything. Is that possible? <laughs> Don't be anxious about anything? How are you doing? I mean, i, I, I got to work on that. I mean, there's a lot to be anxious about out there, isn't there? But Paul says, don't be anxious about it, but with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Take your needs to God. And then look what he says will happen. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Did you know that there is a peace of God that transcends all understanding? Let me, let me translate that for you. That means it's a peace that doesn't make sense. You should be pulling your hair out, worried to death. People see what you're going through, and they say, how are you doing this? It's this. The peace of God that doesn't make sense. Jesus said, in this world you have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world peace I leave you, my peace I give you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. A peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Nothing is too big for God's power or too small for God's concern. Take it to the Lord. If, it's, if it matters to you, it matters to him. Fourth, pardon. I ask 
God to forgive me for my sin. Jesus, and Jesus told us to pray this, by the way. I'm getting myself in a lot of trouble. You know, when you preach Jesus, you, you, you do get in trouble sometimes. Jesus told us to pray, forgive us our sin. So is it okay with you that if Jesus said to do that, is it okay with you if I do that? Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our trespasses is what he's saying here. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I pray this prayer a couple times, sometimes three day, times a day. I want to keep short accounts with God. Maybe, and sometimes what will happen is I won't even realize at the time maybe my attitude was a little wrong or maybe I was a little short with how I dealt with somebody. Uh, what Maybe my thought pattern was wrong about something. And as I go throughout the course of the day, I'll pray this, I'll pray it at the end of the day, pray it at the beginning of the day. Um, and the Lord will bring something to mind. I, I want to have a clear channel with God. I can't do anything without that clear channel. I don't want anything to come in between me and the Lord. And that's where a lot of the peace from life, in fact, that, that is the basis for peace in life. I mean, look, if you don't have to worry about dying because your sins are forgiven, you don't really have a whole lot to worry about, do you? That's the deep, deep peace that God gives. Number five, I pray for other people. Matthew six twelve, as we also have forgiven our debtors. So one of the things that I need to do here is I need to take time to do an inventory to see if I'm holding a grudge against somebody. You know that a grudge is outside of outright sin is the greatest hindrance in a relationship with God. Bitterness. Paul speaks about it so strongly that it says just like giving the devil free lodging in your heart. You're not even charging him rent. You're just letting him hang out there when you're bitter from holding a grudge against somebody. You pray for the jerk at work, <laughs> the neighbor who drives you crazy, the spouse who made you mad on the way to church today. We'll just go right on past that one. Pray for the spiritual needs of others. Pray for emotional needs. Pray for mental needs that people have. Boy, mental illness is such a big thing right now. Uh, with everything that's going on in our world, Jesus said it would happen. We need to, there's so much we need to be praying for. I pray for the spiritual needs of other people at this time. And then the last one is protection. I pray for protection and direction. And lead us not into temptation. Protection and direction. Somebody I heard several years ago, I don't know how theologically correct this is, but I think it's a good thing to pray anyway. He said, often when I pray this prayer, I pray, God, protect me from the devil and also protect me from myself. Anybody need protection from themselves? I mean, I can get myself in a whole lot of trouble without the devil even helping me sometimes, right? So I, I just I pray for God to protect me from stupid decisions or, or my own, you know, kind of, I, I get these plans and ideas and I'll spend a half day on something that may or may not have been what God wanted me to do in the first place. Lead us not into temptation. 1 Peter 5, 8 to 9, Peter wrote this, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. This is a fight we are in, Christians. It is a war. There is a real devil, a personal, intelligent, powerful force of evil at work in this world with demons, and they have, there's a lot of them, they have a lot of power, and they are assigned to attack Christians, and their goal is to steal, to kill, and to destroy, and to take Christians down. That's why we need to be spiritually in shape. We're going to honor veterans in a, here in a few minutes. They were trained to fight an enemy. Thank God for them. We, we need that. We live in an evil world where people will stand up against evil. Well, we have an enemy, Christian. And it's a fight. And you need to train like you're in Green Beret school. In fact, the more serious you get following Jesus, the 
more you're going to have to fight. You know, there's a whole lot of Christians out there I'm convinced the devil doesn't even have to worry about. He's got limited resources. Keep that in mind, okay? He's not like God. He doesn't have unlimited resources. So he, he has to target the people who are really doing something. A lot of Christians just kind of come to church and do their Sunday thing, and they're not really making any impact on the world. The devil doesn't have to worry about them. He's going to focus on the ones who Sunday to Sunday are living what they do, say they live, and out there trying to make a difference. That's prayer. Second one, I won't spend as much time on this, not that it's because it's less important, but because it's a little easier to deal with, is uh, the Bible. We need a plan for getting the Bible in our daily lives. Let me give you five, t- uh, I'm not really tips, but aids maybe that you can remember. First one is read systematically. Maybe it's a through the Bible in a year plan. Maybe you pick a book of the Bible that you want to study. And you maybe you read a chapter a day, you read a paragraph a day, however you want, maybe a verse a day, however you want to do it, but get a systematic plan. Occasionally, it's okay just to open your Bible and see what God wants you to do, okay? I read about one guy that did this, and when he opened the Bible, it, it just said something that if he had done it would have just been terrible because of where he opened the Bible up to. It can be a dangerous thing to just open the Bible and say, I'm going to do whatever God wants me to do in this situation. Secondly, is read expectantly. You're about to meet, when you read this book, it's God's letter to you. God has written a letter to you. Read it expectantly, not legalistically. Third, read it devotionally. You're not writing a paper. You're not getting graded for it. This is an opportunity to express devotion. Fourth, read it obediently. If God tells you to do something through what you read that day, sometimes he tells me to do something very specifically, sometimes he doesn't, but if he does, uh, write it down, put it on your day timer, your to-do list, whatever you have to do, and do it. And fifth, read lovingly, not legalistically. Let me show you a slide for reading scripture. It's called the SOAP approach. And if this helps you, go ahead and use it. I don't know if I put room in this in your notes for you, but the letter S is scripture. O is observation. You just write down what it says. If, if you read a scripture and it says, let's just use this one, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went to a solitary place. Observation is Jesus got up early in the morning and went off to a solitary place to be alone with God. That's all it is. This isn't rocket science. Uh, application. What application might Jesus have for me there? Well, if I'm not having a quiet time with God, the application might be maybe I need to have a quiet time with God, right, based on that passage. Uh, If you tend to put it off as the last thing that you do in the the day, maybe the Lord would say to you, you know, it's not about being up at 5 in the morning, but maybe this needs to be the first thing you do rather than the last thing you do so that you make sure you get it done. However the Holy Spirit speaks to you. Letter P is prayer. I pray about what I read. You know, if every Christian would do this and pray, I think we'd have revival in America. I truly do. Just these simple steps. Let's take some time for application. And I want to look at Mark 135 as we close. It said, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up left the house. Let's just walk through this, okay? I've already talked about this a little bit. Very early in the morning, you know, in those days, they didn't have light or electricity. So when it was dark, there wasn't a whole lot to do. So people went to bed pretty early in those days. Uh, So it wasn't anything for people to get up at 4 or 5 in the morning in those days. That's because a lot of them went to bed at 8 or 9 o'clock because there wasn't a whole lot to do. There wasn't late night TV and all this other stuff that we've got, phones and stuff like that, just to keep us up and distracted at night. So Jesus got up very early. I don't think it has to be very early in the morning. Maybe you're a third shifter, and maybe it's 8 o'clock at night for you because you're going to go in later that day. You know, it's when you wake up, it's your first thing that you do. I think that's important. It says Jesus got up. I would highly encourage you to not try to do this while you're in bed, right? What happens when you're laying down horizontally, comfortable and warm? 
we go to sleep, right? Get up. <laughs> I mean, just getting up can be the most important spiritual thing you do in the morning. It says he left the house. I don't necessarily think you have to leave the house, but houses were smaller in that day. There might have been 12 stinky men sleeping around in the same house that night. I don't know. And it may, he may have just needed to get up and get away just to get some space. He went off to a solitary place. That word solitary is key there. He's alone. Some of you are extroverts, and being alone is just really hard for you. I understand. I'm an introvert, and I, I can be alone for long periods of time and it not bother me. Uh, but we all need some alone time. We all need some silence time. Introverts, I would say to us, you also need some people time. We've got we to gotta balance all that out. So Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they explained, everyone is looking for you. Let's go somewhere else to the nearby towns and villages, Jesus said, so I can preach there also. That is why I've come. So you see, here's what happens in life. You will either let God set your schedule or somebody else will set your schedule for you. Have you found that to be true? So Jesus was wondering what he was supposed to do that day. He just had a great ministry the place he was at, and his disciples came looking for him and said, Jesus, all these people you just ministered to here, they want to see you again. And Jesus, well, I understand that, but the Father wants me to go to the next town. It didn't make sense logically to go to the next town, but spiritually that's what his Father told him to do. So let me ask you some questions. When will you set aside time for prayer and Bible study? If I can politely nudge you today, don't tell me you don't have time, okay? How many hours a day are there? Not a trick question. 24, right? Do some people get more than 24? Everybody gets 24. Right? Thank you, Bob. I'm glad you came today. <laughs> I'm going to bring him up here. 24 hours, right? Now, some of us have different kinds of schedules where a lot of alone time isn't real possible, but we all get that amount of time, so we've got to figure out how we're going to do this. Where will you go for this time? When will you start? What changes will you need to make? What tools will you need? Who will hold you accountable? These are just some questions that you can set up. Susanna Wesley had 19 kids. I found out this uh, week only 11 of them lived to adulthood. Uh, but at one time, she had 11 kids living in her house all at the same time, maybe more. Can you imagine, and they were small houses, it would be kind of tough to get quiet time with 11 little rugrats running around, right? And she would literally, at times, pull her apron over her head. And when her apron was over her head, her kids knew, don't bother mom. That was her alone time. Can you imagine? God bless her. So moms, stay-at-home moms, I understand it's more difficult for you in some situations, but uh, we, we, find, we need to find these times, not legalistically, not because the pastor said to do it, not so you can be better than somebody else, or any of that stuff. We need it. It's a means of grace. Say that with me. Say means, means of grace. This isn't rules and regulations. This is a gift from God to us. If I could get, if, if God could just do one thing today, it would be to erase the legalism of your past and replace it with a gracious awareness that God loves you and wants you to know Him in a deep and intimate way. I got a couple tools I'd like to just share with you. How many of you use U version Bible apps? Anybody? It's a great tool. There's an app for that. Did you know that? <laughs> You version. You just go to your little Play Store, whether it's Apple or Android, and you can download U version. They've got so many plans on there that you can use. It's a great jump starting tool. I have a Bible memory app that I use. Um, it's helped me greatly. It's called Bible Memory Verse app. It's tricky. <laughs> uh, you can go download that, find it on your Play Store. That will help you. It's a good way to be able to meditate on Scripture throughout the course of the day. And I would just say this to close, one other thing. I used to spend all my time at the beginning of the day with the Lord and hope that would be enough to get me through the rest of the day. I found out that by noon or 1 o'clock, almost every time somebody had kind of bugged me, done something, or I got stressed, and I would just keep going, just keep going, keep going. Somebody said to me once, 
you know, stress is like a is light on your dashboard. When the light comes on, you need to check it out. So now what I've done is uh, one of the tips that I've added that's been great a great help for me is usually around noon or 1 o'clock, I take about 15, 20 minutes with the Lord, uh, sometimes right before I go to bed, just to keep my connection with God throughout the course of the day. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads with me. I'd like you to just ask God. This isn't about what I think you should do, okay? If I were to tell you to do what, and I was going to share my plan and how I do it, but I, just, I, I decided not to. There's reasons to do that and reasons not to do that. But I think today it would be best for you to just say, God, what do you want me to do in this area of my life? Just ask him that question. And listen. Maybe you need to spend some time on that question today when you're alone. And then I would encourage you to just add that to your life. Father, I pray that through this message and what we've heard about studying your word and prayer, God, I, I pray again. For me, it was just such a legalistic thing growing up. I'm thankful for the people who emphasized it because it was important. It needed to be emphasized. But God, I, I pray that you'd remove the legalism. We, we talked about tearing down the walls of religion today. You really are better. You've got so much better for us. You, you want a relationship with us and you want to change us from the inside out and make us brand new people by your grace and God I pray by the grace of God that it would be done in the name of Jesus we pray amen amen we're going to watch a video at this time we had Veterans Day last Friday November 11th and we want to take a moment to honor our veterans. So I'm going to turn it over to our crew, and we'll watch this video, and then we'll close with a time of honoring our veterans. like to do something to close that I felt Ned to do it as we were worshiping together. I'd like to ask all of our veterans, if you would, to stand right where you're at with us today. I would like to ask, would you mind, if you're able, if you can't come forward, that's fine, but if you would, could, could you please come on up here right now? I want to close this service. We want to honor you, but we also want to pray over you.
on behalf of our country today. I think our Greta is a stage in our country where we need a lot of prayer. So if you guys could come on up here. And once they get up here, I'm going to ask you to kind of come in behind them. And we're going to close this service in a word of prayer for our country. As they're coming forward, let's show them our heartfelt appreciation by giving them the honor that they deserve with a round of applause. Uh, you want to thank them before they go. I want to say thank you for your service to our country, for what you've done for us. Let's pray for our country right now. Father, I thank you for these veterans who are among us today. Maybe they're listening. Maybe there's some active service members online with us right now. Lord, we thank you for them. We lift them up to you. We pray your blessing upon them. We couldn't be more thankful than we are for the sacrifices they've made for us. Lord, I'm thinking about Charles Mayfield, who served in Vietnam suffered all sorts of things because of things that he saw, things that nobody should have to see. I pray emotional, mental, spiritual, physical wholeness over these veterans. I pray that you'd go into the deep recesses of their hearts and bring healing where it's needed. Give them grace and peace. And may they feel our heartfelt appreciation today. May they know how much we care for them and love them. And God, be with our soldiers today in harm's way. May we be right in our fight as we fight for what is right. And God, we pray for our country. We're concerned. It's not a political issue. It's a spiritual issue that we're concerned about. We need renewal. We need revival in this land. This, the church of Jesus needs revival and renewal. And God, may we be that renewal. May we be that revival by opening ourselves up to you and allowing you to use us as you would please. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Veterans, again, you have our deep felt, deepest felt appreciation, heartfelt appreciation for your service. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. You're dismissed. Stuff. I was supposed to make this announcement. I forgot to bring the box.